in <laughs> Okay. In the mortal words of Jared Spool, it depends. And if you don't know who Jared Spool is, you'll find out tonight. Okay. I met him once. <laughs> In the beginning, and this is a long time ago, what? Make computers usable? Now, here is the early 80s where we have command line interfaces, the IBM PC. That's what, when you turned it on, that's what you got. Wait, what about punch cards? <laughs> no, I, I don't go back that far. Man, okay, you went back. Or Commodore, right? Atari, went, et cetera, CPM. Yeah, you brought up punch cards. You, you went back there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I know a few people who did. So I know a few people actually, who did. I was, actually, I was one of them. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, so, and you know, 64K of RAM, 360K floppy disk. And as long as you knew what to type in at that prompt, you were doing, you were doing okay. Now, there is something about command line. Uh, I don't, and, and, but once you typed in something like Word, you would get a sort of a primitive menu system here. And I'd like to say something too about usability. I'm talking about not people who write documentation for programmers, like API writers. And I'm not talking about those kinds of users. I'm talking, uh, you know, system administrators, because they do all kinds of stuff at the command line to this very day. You know, you're, there's a command you can get into Windows. You just type CMD and you get something that looks like this. But what I'm talking about is a kind of usability for uh, just ordinary folks who want to write a letter or buy a shirt <laughs> online, you know, that sort of thing. Really mundane tasks. Now, you also notice I'm going back to 1984 even though I said I have 30 years of usability and that dates back to 1992, which was the year I made my first usability test. Usability wasn't really a buzzword in those days. So anyway, this is something from my, uh, uh, my very, very first tech writing job. This uh, called the View 1200, 1984. Machine vision, what for non-contact inspection for process control. It had a command line interface, a rudimentary menu system like the one I showed you with Word. I don't have a picture of their menu system, unfortunately, or I'd show it to you. And of course, hard copy documentation. Now what this was, was designed for, Okay, non-contact inspection. This was uh, for companies who made automobile parts. They wanted to see if they were in spec. So you have a video camera hooked to a computer and it takes a picture of this edge of the part and that edge of the part. And then it measures the distance between them to see if they're within spec. This is designed to be used on the shop floor by a real blue collar guy who knows parts, but who doesn't know much about computers, right? So, um, my boss at the time, his name was Roy Culgin, he passed away a few years ago, uh, was hired because we need a manual. So they wrote one, but it was written by engineers, and this is the original. Um, the on a dot matrix printer. Does anyone remember what dot matrix printers are? Okay. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes. There's plenty of us here to do. Yeah, it was like 50 pages. Oh my God. <laughs> We're all old. I'm getting grayer by the minute here, kids. Oh my God. <laughs> my boss, you know, who hired me, I, 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 that was my first job as a junior tech writer, he says, no, we need two manuals. There are two kinds of uh, of, of users here. There's the kind that wants to work on the command line and do, you know, programming. This this gadget has its own that is brilliant. Internal programming language, mm -hmm. right? 
Uh, and then there were just the poor guys on the shop floor that just wanted to load their parts onto the thing and press the button and get it to measure things. And that's what he did. That is the proverbial, this is it, the VIEW 1200 instruction manual, okay? 400 pages. When I say a 400 page user manual, this is what I'm talking about. So even though usability wasn't a thing in those days, we were contributing to usability. Understand the audience, who's using the system and why. Task analysis, what are they trying to do? Terminology. Uh, and then the last three things are sort of the stereotypical tech writer tasks uh, in terms of, yes, yeah, they do style and typography, but they don't understand. But this is how you did usability in those days. You wrote a manual. And this is a very, very nice, classy. Oh, it's gorgeous. You know, it was printed with a Diablo 630 printer, you know, and it had really, oh, it's just so gorgeous. I wish I could show, I wish we were meeting in person so I could show it off. But, uh, you know, it just looks, it, it's much more usable. But, but, the question of every tech writer from that era is, is anybody going to read any of this? And the second question is, why does it take 400 pages to explain how to do something so simple? You know, uh, a, a photo of this edge, a, a, a photo of image of this edge, and you want to measure the distance between them. What's, you know, why does it take 400 pages to explain how to do that? So. I, I tell people I write manuals that no one read. No one read because yeah, okay. they don't. But they pay me money, so I just do it. Yeah. So to your point, Nikki, about the dot matrix printers, Okie Data Microline 190. Damn. Okay. <laughs> oh dear. Um <laughs> yeah, so we know there's got a problem because especially the engineer, see again, it was my boss, the experienced tech writers, who said, no, we need two manuals because we have two different types of users. And that's that they that they recognize that is just amazing to me. I mean, that's that is just like that's half the battle right there. It's just recognizing that there's more than one user. I couldn't have seen that though. But see, he was the senior writer. He knew all this stuff. He that's, that's great. And he, you know, I didn't even know they could do that back then. <laughs> have a say. Have a vote. I know. <laughs> <laughs> engineers were really surprised that it was 400 pages long because they thought it was so easy to use, you know, the ones that were actually... Yep. The ones that built it, yeah. Yeah, the ones who built it. And also, yeah, 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 so... But if you can't uh, explain it to your grandmother, it's not going to work. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. This is just a build collar guy on the factory floor who wants to measure these parts, you know? and find out if they're within spec. So, now part of the reason for the command line was the technology of the time. Now, I think someone be before the meeting mentioned that Xerox Park invented the graphical user interface and, and Windows, you know, like the Apple Macintosh, you know, was based on the design of Xerox Parks, you know. Yep. But those were enormously powerful computers for their day. You know, your IBM PC with 64K of RAM, you know, couldn't do that. But the advances in technology like graphical user interfaces, more powerful microprocessors and display technologies, and then in the early 90s, the World Wide Web, and documentation could be digitized, you know, HTML, WinHelp, you didn't have to have a 400 page manual. And that is what also enabled a, uh, you know, you could make user interfaces fancier. Okay. So here's another phase in my career when I first got into usability. 
I work for a company, as Richard mentioned, I have a PhD in chemistry, and I got a job as a technical writer for a company that made uh, chemical drawing software. Now, in the 1991 release, task or, you know, here's what it looked like, task-oriented printed manuals and no UI text, right? Whereas by the 1998 release, you see they're having these, uh, it, it's kind of hard to see here, but when you click this button, it tells you what it's supposed to do. You know, you say this, this creates an arrow that looks like this at any angle and has a little uh, help there, right? That's, I think, um, embedded user assistance, you know, user assistance is a word they use for it, uh, for the most common tasks, no printed manuals, but there was an on, there was online help because wind help was, uh, had been invented. However, and the tech writer's contribution, you know, what does a technical writer same thing, understanding the audience, who's using the system and why. Task analysis, terminology, solid guidelines, typography, layout, illustrations, but also user UI text and online documentation. That was a new thing, okay? And we would work with the programmers to get you know, the UI text right. And that was 98, you say? Yeah, right, yeah. But uh, we still had a problem. Is anybody going to read any of this? Why does it take a four megabyte help file? To yep, yep, yep. <laughs> and another one is, do they really need all those features anyway? Uh, hmm. Well, let me see. Anybody I use that paperclip. Anybody use that Windows paperclip back in the day? Oh, oh. <laughs> Clippy. Clippy was so annoying. <laughs> yeah. I could yeah. never hold anything together with Clippy. Okay. So, and just a good meme today, though. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there, there's thereby hangs a tail. But they really need all of those features anyway. Well, there was. Oh, yes. Now, that they really need all those features. Now, the way they asked people whether they needed stuff, <clears throat> what figured out what people needed, was to ask them, you know, would you like to do this? Would you like to do that? Now, nobody says no to a feature, right? So you had all this bloated software with all these features that nobody really needed. I have a question. Did some companies actually did actual usability testing where they actually put people into a room to use the product. I heard that happen once in a while, but I've that, never actually seen it. It, it that, did. I was privileged to, that's what I've been doing for the past 30 years. Yes. Yeah, it, it did, but it was not widespread. Yeah. Yeah. There was the company I worked for, they had done it while I was there. Mm-hmm. I was when I was working for Cadence Design Systems, they did that. Mm -hmm. cool. Now, for the next generation product, you know, the successor, this is, I was not, not able to get, you know, because that one's disappeared, but the older product, okay, because we understood the audience better and what we, what they needed. Here's an example of what happened. 12 out of the 13 controls on this dialogue were totally unnecessary. Okay? They didn't need it. You know, we didn't have to support that stuff in the new in the in the uh, in this next generation product. Okay, what happens why, today? <laughs> and what happened? Why did that happen? Because of advances in user research. Don't ask them what they want. Watch them at work and find out what they need. Yep. This is gorillas in the mist, or in this case, users in the mist. And that, <laughs> kind of an analogy. Wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, Diane Fossey was observing the, the uh, gorillas and she didn't interact with them and she was very quiet and just watched them do their gorilla things. 
And that's how she found out about them. Well, this is the same sort of thing. And again, this is Jared Spool. He came up with this. He comes up with so many interesting. But boy, did those gorillas sure love the manual. Him? What's that? <laughs> I said, boy, did those gorillas love the manual. <laughs> <laughs> did they eat the manual or they just simply like, uh... I think the real question is whether or not Diane Fossey went ahead and made a manual for the gorillas. <laughs> Mm, 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 mm. Are you sure that was Jared Spool, though? Yeah, Jared Spool. He's the one who came up with that expression, users in the mist. Yeah. Now, oh, yeah. he did write documentation, but it was published in scientific papers, you know. Because so. uh, the contextual design thing was uh, Hugh Beyer and Karen Holtzblatt. Yes. And that was like 98. I know. I know. There, there are a bunch of things that I, I, there's so many names that people, <laughs> I know, and ne um, Jacob Nielsen, and yeah. you know. so this is what we're trying to do. Now, this sort of user research where you're looking at behavior, there are two kinds of it, quantitative and qualitative. Quantitative is like, that'll tell you what they're doing, like on the web, number of page views. Um, success or failure of goals. Like, for example, there was one company that discovered, you know, they were doing e-commerce. They were selling, I think it was Macy's or Sears or something. And they discovered that two thirds of the customers abandoned their shopping carts without buying anything. Okay. Um, and then there are other metrics that tells you what they're doing, right? But you don't know why. Why did they abandon their shopping carts, right? So qualitative can do that. And there are a number of techniques. And again, there are so many needs. Job shadowing. Job shadowing, where uh, and uh, where, where you literally mimic their movements. You know, you're in their workspace and you do everything Contextual inquiry and field studies are the same thing. This is the gorillas in the mist where you watch them you know, while they're doing, interacting with the products. And then, of course, there's usability testing. And that's what I have the most experience with. I should say that the uh, contextual inquiry is very powerful. That, one, that example that I showed you where we got rid of 12 out of 13 features, 13 controls, that came directly from contextual inquiry studies of the uh, customers. So we didn't have to support that in the new product, which was great. So it's so, you know, when all these technological um, innovations are coming in, there's also research methods. And of course, this is extremely important in e-commerce. Amazon, from what I understand, they're constantly usability testing their, you know, uh, you know, doing metrics. And the three hundred million dollar button. This is uh, Jared Spool of User Interface. There was a company. This is the company that I mentioned that people were abandoning their. Uh, the, you know, the web metrics told them that people were abandoning their shopping carts. And uh, Barrett School did a bunch of usability testing on it. And he discovered that just by changing one button, he was able to <laughs> get them to go. And if you want to know the details of exactly what it is, uh, there's the, there's the uh, there it is. <laughs> My goodness. So, um, but again, where are the tech writers in this? We're still, we're, we're, we're in the blue. We're understanding the audience. What the heck is, you know, the future research about? It's understanding the audience. Uh, we're just getting better data now. Analysis, terminal, you know, the traditional things. Reference information when needed. And this new thing, qualitative user research, okay, which is, as I say, the usability testing, the contextual inquiry. Now, I wanted to take a little bit, you know, a conversation we had earlier 
um, in, in, in the talk. And that is about usability and user experience. Technical writers, also known as UX writers. I prefer usability professionals. Um, the Usability Professionals Organization was formed in 1991, but in 2012, they changed their name to the User Experience Professionals Association. You know, because my goal is always usability and you know, just give them what they need, not what they ask for. Now, you guys mentioned Clippy, okay? Well, one of the things, <laughs> there was an interesting anecdote that um, I, and this was quite recently, someone, uh, you know, they were asking, I, I don't remember the source, but they said, uh, gee, why don't you put a little prompt in here that tells me, uh, that, that monitors what I'm doing and tells me what I'm doing. There were... <laughs> oh, and that's probably why Microsoft put that in there. And then it got to be so... You know, that's why you don't ask them what they want. You know, so, okay. So, so there's some terminology. And as I say, I am um, a little bit, as I say, old fashioned here. Now there's something about user experience design and technical writers. Okay. And I think you brought that up too. Uh, I I think right. Um, cast, cast, yeah, yeah. Designers are, more, US designers are not necessarily visual designers, but it does involve some visual design, right? Patterns, uh, we use I, possibly. Technical writers' vocabulary, style, and tone, and minimalist writing. Mm -hmm. uh, if I may interject. Yeah. Um, UX designers actually go beyond that as well. I mean, har hardware design becomes a factor as well. Um, some of my previous hardware yeah. gigs were definitely on the touch and the handle and the nuances or the color of the object that you're working with. Mm -hmm. How to make it easy to carry, safe to carry. Um, how do you know what is positioned where and so on. So the visual design is part of it, but also just the actual ergonomics. I guess it'd be a big term. I think I, I think of it as being more along the lines of ergonomics. So, for example, um, one of the things that I've dealt with is, is um, you know, like these big giant plasma display screens in a uh, conference setting, and the visual designers are like, "Oh, pretty, do 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 do," and I'm thinking, "Okay, well, all right, how high is it? How high is the? How tall is the person who's looking at it? What do they need to do?" especially if they have to interact with it. I'm thinking about sort of like where it's positioned. Do they have to look up, blah, blah, blah. Whereas the visual designers are, ooh, pretty colors. So that's why, why I question visual design. And currently there is an increasing blend um, of visual designers and, um, and UX designers where people are being hired as UX designers who are actually like graphic designers that don't know anything at all about user experience all they know they know a lot about color and composition yeah, yeah. that's where that's where you also have you also have you also have a mix of skill set that's being put out there by hiring managers because what i'm seeing is i'm seeing yep. a lot of these technical writing jobs where they are asking for the technical writer to not only be able to put content where it's needed and to make it concise, but also they want the technical writer to um, implement graphic design, okay, yeah. into documentation. And, yeah, so, and sweep up while you're on the way out, right? Yeah, right, exactly. Thanks. All and the so, things. So my, my whole take is, okay, you sound like you want both a tech writer and a graphic designer. And to me, that that's, that's a pay scale that has to be rediscussed. <laughs> okay, so. I do it all the time, all the time. Yeah. Designing graphics. 
I'm, I'm cheating. I'm using Google slides to create graphical shapes and then exporting it as a PDF or do screenshots and then crop it and just throw it in the thing. Um, I do so all sorts of whatever, whatever tool I have, I'll just make a graphical uh, flow chart or presentation or some type of explanation of a concept and then dump it into the document. Yeah, but that's, that's kind of what I did when I was at Cadence, but we didn't do it to that degree. What we did though, what we did do though, is we did, we did, um, we, we altered images because there were changes that were made by the engineers. So we would go in and then we would alter those, those images to meet the standards of the changes that the engineers did. But yep. that was the extent of what we did. We didn't do anything more where we added pie charts and all this other stuff. We didn't do any of that. Yeah, I, I know exactly what you're talking about where you just, you know, create a white box and cover up that button because that button's not there anymore, you know. Right, exactly. Did it all the time. Yeah. Yeah, I was never forced to do that. I was always, you know, but it's just, you know, the fact that there's such a lively discussion shows the kind of vagueness. And again, this is just my own personal experience and my take on it. You know? Yeah, but I, I think that my, my experience is, is kind of, I mean, I started this later than you did, but, um, you know, my, my first UX design was job was in 2000, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but my experience, um, I, I actually started in the internet biz in 98. Um, but my experience was that, that that's, I, like I said, when we were doing our little introductions at the beginning is that STC was my first, um, I mean, that was in like 98, my first you know, professional organization that I joined. And um, we, there's always been this just complete merger between UX and, you know, and, and technical writing is it's just combined. But there's also, you know, also emerging in with like, um, you know, information architecture, which is very much tied into technical writing. That's sort of the same skill sets, they, they come in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, mm -hmm. there's so many words for the same thing, you know? Yeah, it's but there, there are, I mean, there are different aspects, like information architecture is not UX, it's a subset of UX, just as visual design is, but I never thought of graphic designers as being UX designers. They're graphic designers, they're, you know, their specialty is in color and composition and, you know, that kind of stuff, uh, branding. But you know, it is part of the family. But yeah. the but the title of the, the job just keeps blurring and blurring and blurring. Exactly. You know, I was a contract yeah. technical writer forever, and there's usually only one tech writer on the job, no illustrators, or if you're lucky, they'll have a contract illustrator. And pretty much I'm I'm pretty much doing the, you know, you know, taking out the garbage, doing the basket weaving. <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm yep. just like doing the folding the laundry, uh, you know, everything, anything. Don't forget do. the cars. You got to do the mechanic stuff. Got to wash the car. You got to wash the car. You got to put the wax on, you know, wax By on. By the way, while you're at it, you it, pay the lighting bill too. Yeah, pay the bill. Make sure you turn the lights off when you leave, all that stuff. You know, I had to okay. clean up all the messes. Information architecture to me is a whole lot closer to database design and management and data management type stuff. Uh, but but UX design should be straddling program development and documentation, really. Yep. Usability, UX, it that it should be straddling that region. And they and, and you go ahead. Yeah, you really should have a close handle on what the crazed programmers are doing, so you have a chance to steer them before they block you into any nasty corners. Absolutely. Uh, this is a bit off topic, but have you guys tried uh, wireframes and paper prototyping? Um, Absolutely. Dabbled with yeah. a little bit, yeah. Yeah. I had a lot of deliverables that were that based on that on wireframes and similar stuff. Yeah, that I mean, would assume that you had somebody to test it against. Some companies actually want no. to know if you ever designed an app, um, and if you could design an app, at least try to design an app that you suddenly are instantly qualified as a UX designer. 
because you designed an app. Well, that's interesting because I did that about roughly, I want to say three months ago when I locked myself in a, a Motel 6 and my computer and I used Kotlin Android developer to design an app for a phone. You're now a uh, UX designer. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, this, this was the thing. I, I didn't, I didn't actually complete it though. That was the problem, but I got close. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you got the fundamental concepts down. That's the important thing. Yeah, the problem is nobody's. I, I haven't ran into anybody that's using Kotlin except Google. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I just want to say uh, these two things: UX designers and technical writers, different skills, but they also have more in common. User, they both do user research. They both do text analysis. They both do usability testing. They both use, we're all technical communicators, right? This is true. Yeah, you know I, tried, I, I tried to apply for UX jobs, but they want, they saw my resume that had tech writing stuff on it. And they just want to know how many apps have you developed? I was like. Go yeah. back to that. Can you get I'm really curious about this because I had never, I would never think of a tech writer as somebody doing these things. Is it in different environments? Because what you the, the areas where I have worked, I've worked at, uh, you know, in-house I've, you know, for like, I, like I worked with, for consumer reports. I've, I've worked for a lot of um, advertising agencies and interactive agencies. And I worked for, um, you know, a, a you know, software companies. Yeah. And in none of those situations would um, a writer be considered a, a UX researcher. Well, yeah. yes, he may not, they may not be, have that. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just, I, what I would like to know is, and what, in what circumstances is that the case? I'm just really curious. This is so interesting. Well, um. My boss. I might want to go work there. <laughs> I, I have to go, everybody. It's been. This has been. This is really interesting. I have to leave the, for yes. food-related reasons. Um, <laughs> there's a table over here with food on it, and I have to go eat it. <laughs> but, okay. Uh, Probably shouldn't tell us that there's a table next to you with food on it, and we can't sit down. <laughs> <That's> not... <laughs> yeah, are we invited? <laughs> Yeah, yeah save, save, hey, Bruce, save time, thanks huh? for joining us. See you Friday. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'll try. Oh, wait. Well, I unfortunately I have to go to Greenville on Friday, but Friday after that. Yeah. Okay, for sure. Well, yeah. If you're right. here knocking on the door, it's us. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, See everybody soon. Bye, Bruce. All right. Nice to meet you, Take Bruce. Care. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. So, Cassie, you, you got a very good point in there. Uh, it's yeah. really depends upon the manager. And the the uh, and 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 if managers are not very good at defining job positions, and so it it gets kind of blurry because they want a UX person, and it's kind of hilarious. You sometimes you hear about recruiters asking for somebody with five years experience in blah, and blah was only invented last year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you hear exactly. about that, and so suddenly this magic word comes out of the industry newspaper saying UX, UX. That's the hot new thing, hot new thing. Whoa. And so the recruiters start calling up and say, "Hey, are you a UX person?" And and if you're lucky, you know what that means. And then second, it's like, "No, I don't have ten years ex UX experience because it just came in the newspaper last week." You know. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, every recruiter, every manager, they. They just go, they just, they throw the bells and whistles into the, into the job listing saying, Hey, I want someone with X number of years to experience doing blah, blah, blah. When, you know, a good old tech writer with graphical experience probably could help out and do the thing, same thing. Yeah. So, yeah. So this Kathy is really actually very yeah. insightful. I mean, because in my, my company is actually actively looking for a user researcher and they are so in demand right now. You cannot get them and there aren't very many that actually know what they're doing okay well cassie let me ask you something because it sounds <laughs> like kind of based on what you were saying as far as what you've done in the different companies is the, the a lot of the stuff you did more more business to business or, or or was it or was it specific devices or 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 can you elaborate on that um i have worked for um mostly for uh, the like fortune companies 
um, working with other fortune companies. Um, so like in advertising agencies, I could be, I, I'll think of some examples here. Like the uh, last advertising agency I worked with was healthcare. So it was working with like Pfizer and, you know, you know, whatever those guys. And then before that, I was with another advertising agency where it was like, um, uh, Pepperidge Farm and Campbell's and, and, uh, uh, makeup companies and, you know, uh, whatever. Okay. Cause I'm, I'm, I'm like this about it. I'm and and Tony just, just asked what type of research you, uh, which what, what type of user researcher that they're looking for? Because I, yeah. you know, I I put it out there pretty often. Nick knows I am in desperate need of a technical writing position. I have been hunting, hacking, and talking. Oh, you're, you're cutting out a little bit there. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. I, right now, can. Okay. So, because I'm getting right now, I'm averaging about four to six phone calls a week from recruiters looking for tech writers, and one of my biggest problems is that they look at my resume. They just see tech writer, okay, and then they call me, and then mostly everything they're looking for is a person with a senior position, okay. So it's like I'm trying to get them to understand. It's like, well, no, I need to come in at the junior or mid level position, okay, where I knew I know a few things, okay. I don't have a I don't have a biotech uh, uh, degree, and I don't have ten years of experience, okay. I don't, in other words, I, I haven't done XML for the last six years or anything. So so. What type of user researcher is are they looking for? Um, I think what what my company is looking for, and this is a software as a service um, company, mm-hmm. um, one hundred percent remote, by the way, based in in um, in Portland. <clears throat> They're looking for somebody who. Um, I, I I don't have the job description in front of me, but I believe that what we're looking for is somebody who needs to be able to work independently in sort of a chaotic environment. It's not exactly a startup, but it's close. <laughs> um, and, you know, be able to uh, wrangle dealing with, the, so a lot of it is like dealing with politics of a, of working with a company. And then, you know, um, maybe, maybe create, the- manage, recruit, all that kind of stuff and run the tests and generate the reports and so on. Maybe, maybe the two of you could discuss that offline. If you could put your contact information in the chat. Sure. Yeah. And then I'll send, make sure that gets to you, Richard, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Because, you know, these silly job titles, I mean, that's the thing with uh, technical, the cardinal sin in technical writing is to, is, you know, we have to get terminology, right? I will let, let me throw one quick anecdote oh, out. Yeah. You got another anecdote? My introduction to IT. I got a call from a hungry recruiter long time ago and said they needed somebody, their client needed somebody who knew knew something about Sarbanes Oxley. I had just read an article about that. I said, oh, yeah, that sounds a lot like ISO 9000, where you tell them what it is you do and show that you do what you say you do. They (laughs) bought it. I had never done ISO. (laughs) You you fake it till you make it. That's what you got to do, Richard. Fake it till you make it. It was a straight tech writing document, the systems type thing. No big deal. Yeah. (laughs) Right, right. Okay, so similar skills, you know, we're all technical communicators, but as, as you guys have said, you know, there is such a skill set and they don't really know what they want. I wish we could do some contextual inquiry on them to, to grow us up in the midst on those folks and see what they need instead of what they need. Well, you know, these people claim to be looking hard for qualified people. How do we lure them in to a situation where we can pick their brains and then educate them? Well, that's beyond the scope of this particular. Maybe you can write a a presentation on this subject, right? I'm just telling you my experience. And so... That would be great for someone to do some recruiting, to recruit the recruiter. And have him come to STC. I would say talk to Andrew Davis. He he uh, he would be the one to ask about stuff like that. Yeah. 
Okay, so now I just wanted to move on to tips for use of successful usability testing. And I think one of the things is I hope this isn't happening these days, you know. Um, but uh, Tony remembers some companies just don't want to do it, you know. Um, and it helps to have an ally or two. And there have been two times uh, Tony Flores, who is here, she, uh, she was working for an engineering software company and uh, she had been trying to get some of the other writers to do usability testing. And I said, sure. So she sort of, and we did usability testing of their uh, um, was, wait a minute, I'm sorry, Nick. I just saw the chat from Tony. That was hilarious. <laughs> saw what? I saw the chat from Tony Flores. You just <laughs> what does she have to say? Oh, I didn't it said, see. It says, I know nothing. I know nothing. <laughs> I know nothing. I know nothing. <laughs> and and this... heroes reference, Ob obscure TV show reference. Okay. Okay, back to Nikki's presentation. Go, Nikki, go. <laughs> And the thing is to lead by, and the way we did it is we, in, instead of testing this horrible um, installation wizard, right? This is like 2008, all right? Um, we had this, you know, manual, installation manual. We tested the manual and we invited the, uh, the lead programmer developer of that product to witness the test as an observer. And the people we had as testers were these really, really smart young folks that had just been through the uh, training in which they'd spent a half day on installation, right? Five day training class. None of them were able to do the, were able to do the test. None of them, they all met. They all failed. And when the developer saw that, all of a sudden he, he just sort of got the message. You know, he got, that was his come to Jesus moment, you know, because, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and you couldn't say they, they weren't technical enough or anything like that because they just come flat out of training on this stuff and they still couldn't do it because the wizard was that bad. And later on the training uh, director, he hated, you know, he, he was always complaining about it. Yeah, yeah, we'll do something about it. So they finally did something about it. But Tony remembers that, bless her. But, so how did, how did, was that done? Like did the, um, the people go in and, and they're given a book, basically a training manual, and probably somebody standing up in front of them teaching them. And then they, you plop them down in front of the screen and say, go for it. And then you, and you watch them. Is that how it was done? No, no. See, they had a training class. Okay. Then like a few weeks later, we tested oh. them literally on what they had, you know, can you do this? And they weren't able to do it. Did the training include like an instructor or did they have a screen in front of them or were they just looking at a book? Yes. They, what, what we gave them, at the, are you talking about what the training class was? or? or yes, what? yes. Yeah. How were they trained? They were trained and they did have, you know, materials there. I don't know if they had, I don't remember. Uh, to cut to the chase, basically the training class was for the new hires. So they were engineers all and they uh, were given the training exercises, had gone through the class. And then when we convinced them to do usability testing, we just gave them the manuals as they were and said, go install the documentation that shipped with the product. And we told them, follow these instructions and install it. Thanks, Tony. And it could not be done. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Oh. We fixed it though. Ow. <laughs> okay, Ow. guys. Okay, guys, I gotta get going. Okay, thanks. Thanks for coming, Richard. Well, you know, we'll see. We're recording this, so you'll you won't miss anything. Okay. Richard, email me.
Yeah, I put it in my email in the chat. I, I saw that, right. but yeah, email me because I'll forget immediately. And, and don't forget, hey, Richard, don't forget Fridays. Right. <laughs> I'll make sure I have my glass of wine. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there was another occasion. In fact, the very, very first, um, yeah, I probably should have, oh, come on, uh, way back. Uh, one one quick thing. Does everyone know how to save the chat? Because there's a lot of information in there, and there yeah. you know, there's three spots at the lower right there where, that you can click and get a menu, and it'll and you can save the, a copy of the chat. Go go ahead, Nikki. I'm sorry to interrupt. Well, no, that's fine. Uh, I just wanted to go back here to this, and remember when I said that. Uh, the chemical dry software, how you get buy-in. My boss at the time, Trevor Grayling, he's since retired. We had these task-oriented, you know, we knew task analysis, printed manuals, and we tested the manuals. We tested, we gave them some typical tasks and, and we tested the manuals. And, and he invited the, uh, you know, the, the developers, and they caught the bug, you know, that was their coming to Jesus moment, you know what I mean? And it also inspired, it was a come to Jesus moment for me too, because at that time I was part of the company where I was doing stuff for system administrators and developers. And I went and uh, I usability tested this, and that was my very first usability test. I had, a de I had developers were my testers and I said, okay, Here's a task. Can you do it using these uh, examples in this book? And perhaps I should mention that this got sort of an honorable mention at the uh, Touchstone at, at the Technical Communication Conference. This one got a really good prize, the one from 1984, but that's <clears throat> nothing. Okay, so, and uh, let's see. So, so that's, he, he, he just led by example. I hope that most places recognize the importance of usability testing these days. But just in case you come into one of those places like Tony and I were at, or, you know, uh, test the document. Oh, and another thing is do a dry run before the first test because something always goes wrong, you know, with, and, and you don't have to waste a tester to do it because you can get Anybody can just go through and make sure the Zoom is working or whatever. Now, during the test, this is part of the real soft skills here. When you're, um, when faced with difficulty using computers, people tend to blame themselves, okay? This is one of the things that, that sort of uh, human factors, you know, uh, and the other thing is to get good results, make the test environment resemble the environment where the tester will actually use the product. Users in the mist, you know? Observers are allowed, but must remain silent and be invisible during the test. Don't let bosses observe. One at that, I was at a usability test. I ran a usability test at that company that Tony and I worked at. And the guy's boss was in the room and he saw him. I mean, we're human. You know what I mean? The, he felt so embarrassed because his boss was seeing him stumble through the, <laughs> through the, to use the interface. But, you know, so that's another thing. Keep testers' names confidential. I always refer to them as tester one, tester two, tester three, whenever I'm writing a report, because you don't want things to be, um, you know, you don't want it to be personal, right? And finally, expect the unexpected. You never know. They just do things that you'd never expect. You know, I mean, I, I moderated a lot of usability tests. Gosh, could you, I noticed you did such and such. What were you thinking when you did that? And again, you know, the only thing in the test environment is they have to verbalize. They have to say what they're thinking. So, and finally, I just like to mention some resources here. Um, some books. 
that I've used. And thank you very much, oops, a daisy, for uh, mentioning uh, Karen Holtzblatt and Hugh Beyer. So I will add them right here. Hmm. Um, and then Joe Walensky, he's very good at, uh, I'll change this. Organization, the User Experience Professional Society, STC. And this is uh, Nielsen Norman Group and User Interface uh, Engineering. That's uh, that's Jared Spool. So I'll, but thank you for reminding me about that, Cassie. I was actually, went to a three-day training class by her and you way back in, yeah, I actually went to Boston and and uh, hung out with them for a day and and got you know like one on one. It was it was so fascinating and I just love that the the whole um, contextual research and contextual design thing. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, and you know, finally, I just like to end with an anecdote from my. <laughs> User interface from hell. This is 1978 before I got, you know, about usability. Here I am, a chemist, working on my PhD. And here you have, I have this sample dissolved in water, chloroform, acetone, or some other solvent. And what I want to get to is to get this wiggly black line, which is called a spectrum. And that tells me what's in that sample. What is this stuff? Okay, this is 1978, right? In between. <laughs> Man-line interface, okay, of course. <laughs> that is a beautiful. Documentation from the manufacturer was a list of two letter commands printed on a dot matrix printer. I don't have that, but so I said, Nobody should have to go through this. I'm going to write a manual. So by 1980, I had written a very, very crude task-oriented manual. You don't have, even chemists don't know what these things mean. You know, most of these things, you know, this is the only one, okay? RF receiver and trans, you had to know all this stuff about the hardware to, to, to get anything done, right? So, uh, and, I, and I still have it to this very day. <laughs> and that's how I, I became a technical writer. I still consider myself a usability professional because that's what I was trying to do. I wanted to make things, make it easier. You know, it took six feet, that thing was six feet tall, six feet wide, and it took a minimum of six months of training to get even competent on the thing. You know, because you had to know what all those dials and things meant. So I did what I now realize was a task analysis, you know, and tell them, do this, do that, do that. And uh, finally, and I didn't realize, you know, this again is under the tech writer's con contribution to usability, understanding the audience. Well, that was a no-brainer because this was just something for my um, group, you know, for my people who work for my professor. I did a task analysis. Terminology was pretty standard. Didn't know anything about style. Ah, typography, layout, and illustrations. This was typed on an electric typewriter. <laughs> you know, one thing that, that occurs to me is that the one thing that is, is like missing in the, in the mixture there is like an understanding of, um, of how to run an experiment, you know, basically, which, you know, if you are a scientist, you got a PhD in chemistry, you probably know how to run an experiment. So there's that too, like how to set up an experiment, you know? Yeah. That's why, see the different experiments, there are several yeah. experiments, so that's sort of the end. But until you can do your experiment, you have to go through all this stuff. Yeah. But I think that may be one of the things and it may be the case with, you know, we're talking about technical communication. That may, might be one of the, the assumed things here because you're, you know, you're probably a lot of um, people with science backgrounds um, and, you know, don't even realize that that's a thing that somebody from a different background would not have. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. I, I this this was instinctively. This is not. This is yeah. Not yeah. No. It's great. It's great. But, but add that add that to your list. Like, 
you know, if you've got that, you know, that background and how to run an experiment. When I first started working in the internet business, I remember um, the first big ad agency I worked for was Ogilvy. Mm -hmm. And I remember attending these focus groups and they had this big group of people and they're giving them leading questions and then they're, and the people are giving them answers that they want to hear. And I'm looking at this and going, really has nobody here ever attended a science class? <laughs> what? Who's using the system and what their, well, you know, this is sort of the pair trying to do, trying to achieve, you know, what, what, mm -hmm. it, yeah, typography. But see, this is Nikki wearing your tech writer hat as opposed to Nikki wearing her chemist hat. But there's also there's also the, the aspect of actually creating, setting up the parameters of the test. Okay. And that's where the that's where the science background comes in. And that's where, you know, somebody with a PhD in chemistry probably just assumes. Well you already you know how to do it. And other people don't, I can tell you, they do not. That's why I told you the story about Ogilvy, because it was like, I'm watching, this is how advertising agencies do their testing in oh. focus groups. Mm. You know, they, they get a bunch, a bunch of people in the room that meet their, you know, whatever demographics they want. And they ask them a bunch of leading questions so that they will get, tell them what they want to hear. And they go forward with that. That's how advertising agencies do it with focus groups. Well, in this case, you know, I didn't do any usability testing. I didn't really right. do any usability. I said, we mm -hmm. need a manual, you know, and they have to go through all these barriers. The decoupler. Oh, boy. Yeah. You know, oh, boy, I'm a chemist. What the heck do I care about that, right? And um, so, yeah, style guidelines at the time. You know, this is Nikki when she did it, you know. Add science to that. Add science. Okay, I will. Okay, and you see what I'm saying? Yeah, science. Use okay. a scientific method or inquiry. Scientific method. There you go. Scientific method. Okay, not not a problem. So finally, but is anybody going to read any of this? <laughs> they actually did, but. Why does it take 30 pages to explain how to do something? Why not automate some of those tasks? So here is what it's like today. No more manual. The chemist enters only two things. Are, what, what kind of atom are you looking at? Hydrogen, carbon, and what's the solvent? That's chemically, that's what they understand. They say, what am I observing here? And then that's all they do. They pop it in. They say, okay, I want to do hydrogen and I want to, and this is in chloroform. And then they get what they want. And they say, okay, it's this. That's what it is. So even you know, from 1978 to now, this is a real thing in usability. So this is. Absolutely. A, a very far thing from this, um, but that that's that concludes my talk. I guess we've all wow, we've had a lot of lively discussions here. I was going to say Q um, and A. You got a troublemaker in the mix. Technology. What do we call things? You know. So exactly. I, I want to thank you too for this. Uh, I'm going to reformat this before we, uh, you know, the, these books. I totally that, that user, by the way, that user interface from hell image that you did with the, you know, here's me, here's what I want to do. That, that is brilliant. That is, mm -hmm. that tells such a big story right there. So simply, mm -hmm. it is really well done. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, that's good. Yeah. So, yeah, so I hope all of you have seen the, the pattern here today, what we're looking at here. It's basically, we, we are in the world of the engineer and the engineer Uber Alice, the engineer runs all. The boss is going to listen to the engineer because the engineer makes the thing, whatever the thing is. And us poor technical writers or user interface people come in long after the product's been developed to... Mm -hmm clean it up to fix it explain it explain, explain it, it. After because maybe the sales are low 
or maybe they're having problems with uh, 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 customer support, if they have a customer support, things like that. And it really goes back to the design of the original thing. What you're looking at on the screen right now is pure engineering in action. You need a team of engineers in the room with the chemists just to make yeah. the darn machine work. Yeah, I, I wrote software management uh, or software manuals for um, some hydrologic engineering software for the Army Corps of Engineers. <laughs> and in that case, you know, it were everything, there was no, there were no designers involved at all. It was just straight out ahead of the engineers who were also hydrologic engineers. So boom, there it goes. Actually, you know, it seemed to be pretty much okay. I, as a non-hydrologic engineer, was actually able to figure it out to write the manuals. So it wasn't that bad. So they did a good job then. They, they, I think they did, relatively speaking, now that I think about it. Based on having many more years of experience looking at really horrible interfaces, they did a great <laughs> job. But, um, you know, I, the, the company that I work with now um it, it we've just kind of like did a little i've only been there for a few months and it, it, we've done this restructuring where the technical writers are now actually part of the ux team all right um, so yes. it should be yes. yes and the technical writers do not know what to do they're like <laughs> we have these ux <laughs> meetings and talking about design and the, the and the and the the technical writers are like um it's a That's whole new world. It Just is. be a sponge and absorb it all. But, but what we're trying to do is exactly what you're talking about here is bring those writers in in the design phase. When we're when we're like before the engineers ever get a hold of it, when we're thinking about how we want to, you know, like execute on on the requirements, the writers are there if they're paying attention because most of the time they're like multitasking, doing something else because they're bored. <laughs> <But> <laughs> Have any of you guys worked um, on mobile apps? Because I just wanted to say, yeah. absolutely, yeah. Oh wait, no, you're not. You probably aren't asking me. No, no, no. If, if anybody has, because I never have, but Joe Wilinski, wow, his developing user assistance, he will do um, four rounds of usability testing just to get the name of the button right. That's how condensed the user the UI is on mobile apps. So anyway, yeah. that, thank you for mentioning that. I will, I put that in here and then I send this to a user interface from hell. Yeah, so. Make yourself a note that that's really good. Um, the, the user testing thing, the, the challenge that I find in, you know, in real life and in, in the types of companies that I work for is just, you know, the pace of everything and in advertising agencies in particular, the budget, they don't, if the account people don't push it when they're selling the, the thing at the beginning, it ain't going to happen ever, ever. Although they might want to do a focus group as, as previously described to get people to nod and tell you that you're doing exactly what they want because, you know, that's what you want them to say. That's what they're paying them to do. But, um, where I am now in a software company, um, trying to get user testing is really more about time, like trying to find time to fit it in between sprints and, and you know, before the developers start and before you've got your designs finalized, trying to get that done. Um, and then certainly after things have been built. Yeah. Do you guys use uh, paper prototypes or wireframes? Like I've heard of yes. People yes. be like two or three sprints ahead of the developers. Inside. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's absolutely the case. Paper prototypes I have not seen in this company. Again, I haven't been there for very long, but I've done them in the past. Like I did a, actually did a, a paper prototype with uh, what was the name of that company? Anyway, but it was it was interesting. You know, like holding up. You know, here's mm -hmm. here's a here's a wireframe. You know, tell me what you would do. Point. <laughs> and I was like the bra I was the browser. I was like, you know, turning the pages and finding whatever it was that we would go to when they clicked on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Schools a big uh, um, 
promoter of that sort of thing. He has a lot of interesting uh, mm -hmm. advice in that. Yeah. So I guess that's all. I, I've come to the last of my, I'm glad you like my ability <laughs> inspiration, but that's why I am where I am today. You know? that, that really is, I can, I can, it is like, I mean, I don't know, for me, I'm probably, you know, you're, everybody else is probably going, what? But to me, that is just like, I totally get that, that, that big barrier right in the middle. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, anyway, well, um, I guess I, I, I wanted to say one, one more thing before we, uh, before we cut off the, uh, the, uh, the recording and, and, and clap for, clap for the end of your uh, talk. And that is, I, I did put a couple of um, links in the, in the chat about um, uh, some reviews I wrote uh, a couple of decades ago was the Karen Holtzblatt book and uh, and another one, Mates Are Running the Asylum, which is a ver very relevant to all of this. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, well, thank you all for coming and, and I love your questions. Boy, we're getting some really good discussions, some clashing opinions here. This has been... Yeah. I, I, I wanted to mention that uh, my one, one experience with user uh, 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 interface was what was in the 80s. I had a homegrown, I, developed, I started a homegrown uh, software company doing uh, preschool uh, software. And, uh, and I had kids, you know, test it for me to see what, 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 what uh, how, how it was going. And it was an educational program. And uh, and if the kid got the got got an answer right or the thing right, it would go to the next screen. If it got got the answer wrong, it made it made this funny sound. He said, you know, like you know. And I found out that uh, they loved that sound so much, they deliberately tried to get the wrong answer. <laughs> and so, uh, so, so, I, so that taught me to, to. I had to change it to make that sound to get to to uh, get them to go to the right answer, you know. So, so uh, you know, uh, t testing testing that way uh, was valuable. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you all very much. And uh, I guess we'll just say au revoir and until we meet. Yeah. All that. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. This has been really uh, so so interesting to me. It just mm -hmm. I love it. It was great. And, and this is my first time meeting all of you. So nice meeting all of you. Yes. Okay. Likewise. Thanks. And you too. Please remember Fridays. <laughs> Fridays. Okay. Is, is there a way that I can like put it on my calendar? <laughs> uh, take a look in the uh, chat. I did drop it into the chat a while ago. Uh, would you like to be in our, um, our email list? I can send you that. Yeah. Yeah. That would be good. I will do that. Yeah. Yes. The way to get to all of these things is just to go to stc-berkeley.org, and they're, they're all there. They're yeah. linked to all of them there. Okay. Nice job. Nice walk through memory lane with you, Nikki. Thank you. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm going to turn off the recording now. <laughs>